We are waiting for another minute so everybody can connect. We are here today uh, at our third day of the open house. And the theme of today is the academics, the actual uh, core part of the school. Uh, what are we doing uh, during our classes? Uh, how do we think of it? How we decide what to teach? How do we teach? Uh, so we'll talk about all that. Uh, people are still joining. Let's wait for another minute and we'll be ready to start. Here we go. Okay. So there are some teachers here with, the, with us today as well. Here we go. Okay. So uh, as you know, uh, Lesley Academy is an uh, international uh, blended uh, learning school, meaning uh, we are located, uh, our campus is located in uh, France, uh, though uh, where kids come for the on-site sessions, but in the middle, uh, between the on-site sessions, uh, they study online uh, from wherever they live, uh, from across the world. So, uh, but what does it mean then? Uh, what do we teach? Uh, how do we teach? What kind of program we have? What kind of approach we use? Uh, some people are asking us, are we, uh, if we're located in France, are we a French system school? Or if we are, we have a lot of roots with the uh, US, uh, our US based uh, US system school, or are we generally European, um, whatever that means, uh, system school? Uh, so we're, I would say, uh, a mix of everything, and we'll try to explain it uh, to you today how it works. Okay, uh, Anna is here with us today. Anna is a principal of Leslie uh, Academy, and my name is Aloka, and I'm the academic lead, actually responsible for all these things that uh, we'll be discussing today. Hi, Aloka. I'm happy to see you. And today I would like to continue our open house. Uh, so for those who have been following us for the first two days, you know that Aloka has been asking me questions and today I will be asking questions to Aloka and we'll see uh, what she'll tell us because, well, the lead of academics is the person to talk about the academics, right? So uh, Aloka, my first question would be about, say, the way we treat students when they join school. Let's say you, we have a student who joins us and they come from some, I don't know, school system. Uh, they may come from US, they may be from the UK, and they may think that they're in grade seven or in grade six and those not necessarily match. And they also might think that they're from France, so they're in second grade, or that could be Spain and they're from grade SO4, whatever that means. So what's the grades system? How do we decide which year that the student would go to and how does it match with, um, how to match every single student with the rest of the school? So this is the most fascinating, the most interesting uh, and creative process. So how we decide. Uh, students, it is true that students come to SLA from all kind of different backgrounds, all kind of different programs. Uh, some students come from international schools. Some students come from uh, their state uh, schools. So, and the programs really vary. Uh, first, the programs vary, second, Every student uh, has a different level, even within their age, even within their grade. Uh, there, we accept a lot of students who are, say, uh, very advanced, uh, very much 
above their grade level uh, in some subjects. We at the same time accept a lot of students who say, well, for my whole uh, primary education, I've been hating math, so I haven't really progressed that much because it was my least favorite subject. Uh, so students come from all kinds of different backgrounds. So how do we solve it? How do we juggle it? Uh, each student, upon the admission to this school, go through a series of interviews and testing. And then we see where the student uh, is right now, uh, meaning their level in different subjects, meaning their way of learning, meaning their uh, learning style as well. And uh, then we decide pretty much what would work best for this student. Meaning uh, we don't necessarily look at their uh, formal grade from the uh, formal school system. We place them within their ability uh, group and within their level. So we find the best uh, group for each subject uh, for this very student, this uh, group that will match them the most, uh, whatever their level of math is, they will go to this group, uh, whatever their level of uh, you know language proficiency is, they will go to the uh, group matching that. And that might mean that they might be in the same group with a, mi a mixed age group. So sometimes the younger students can be advanced. Uh, sometimes the older students need a recap of the material that they've been covering, uh, but didn't cover well enough. So it really depends. So we really don't worry about the actual grade of the student uh, upon their admission. Uh, we really test them and place them uh, by the, their level. What we do uh, care about is their age. Uh, we accept students starting from the age 10 uh, up until the age of the age of 15 and 16. Uh, they leave us then going to high school uh, because we're a middle school. Uh, but within that age range, we play we're very flexible uh, in placing them based on their ability. Thank you. And you mentioned uh, that we run kind of placement tests in order to estimate the student's level in each subject. And talking about that, can you elaborate more on which subjects are taught at LSLA and how do we approach generally, um, I would say, how should I ask without spoilers? Um, what's the relation between different subjects at school? That's already that is already a spoiler. In, I did my best. I failed. Okay. So I actually have a support group here. So we have some people who are actually doing it. Uh, we're doing it as a team. So I have some support group here. Let me start, but then I will might give a word to people who are present here as well, who have a, something to say about that. So generally, um, Leslie has uh, three uh, departments: uh, a humanities department uh stem department and um foreign languages department within those three departments uh there are pretty much basic subjects uh as you might see in any standard school say language uh history literature uh science all kinds of science math and the foreign languages but the way we approach them uh this is something where we stand out uh because a huge value for us is to show um, our students that, well, the world is complex. Uh, all those, you know, subjects uh, that we have in school are pretty much sometimes an artificial uh, division of, uh, you know, human knowledge. Say, uh, sometimes history is very much connected with literature, with culture. Uh, no need to say that math is connected with uh, science. Uh, chemistry is directly connected with biology. So uh, it's really important for us to show the kids as many connections uh, between the subjects uh, as we can, th that it makes sense for them that generally, I mean, everything is connected. So. And also that each subject uh, would make sense to them 
uh, relating to another subject. Uh, I would elaborate on that a little, uh, meaning that in, within the humanities department, uh, both say history and literature are being taught chronologically. So say when students are learning uh, ancient history, this is the same time when they're learning ancient literature. Uh, so it all makes sense at that very moment of time, of historic time. Uh, I will use, I will- At the same time in STEM, it's- Is it Aloka or is it me? It's Aloka. It's Aloka, okay. I will, um, okay. I will um, take lead from here and I will use, um, Aloka, I'm sorry you were disconnected. So I had to, I had to take lead from here. And uh, since you were started glitching at the word humanities, I would like to give stage to our present here uh, humanities teacher. Uh, so Bruna, I struggle pronouncing your last name correctly. Um, Berhurst, 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 Moore. I get the kind of first. <laughs> it's why I don't even bother putting it on when I sort of add my name to, to these things. It is Gus Hurst Moore. Everybody struggles. Would you like me to just give an overview of how we approach stuff in humanities? Please do. Please yeah. do. Just yeah, please do. Okay. Um, so um we we approach it chronologically and history and literature work really closely together. Um I'm here, I'm the literature teacher, so I'm here to talk primarily about that. But um definitely we um we try to make it as immersive an experience as we can for students from the very beginning. So the very youngest students, it's chronological. The youngest students are looking at classical civilization and ancient civilization in literature. I literally be begin with Gilgamesh, which is the oldest written text that we have. And we work through uh, Judeo-Christian sort of stories and Old Testament stories. And we look at Greek mythology. We look at Greek fables. We're right in the middle of ancient China right now. And I, I will say I'm, I'm cheating a little bit because the text that we're reading is a fantasy novel set in medieval China. Because one of the things that we do really well is particularly in literature is we try to adapt what we're doing to the group of students that we're teaching. and so. If they are absolutely fed up with fables and myths, which they are a little bit, we're mixing it up a little bit at, just to keep them interested. And for me, the most important thing with the younger students particularly is to get them reading and to get them loving reading so that they have that love that they take forward through all of the years. Um, we, go, we move into the second year into uh, medieval literature, and that goes right up until the early modern period. So we do a lot of, uh, I tr I'm trying to make it as broad as possible. It is right now fairly Eurocentric, this period. So we do Boccaccio, Chaucer, a little bit of Crush on Detroit. We look in depth at Arthurian mythology because that underpins a lot of later texts that we see in the European canon. Um, we would like to broaden it out. Uh, and I'm working on that. After the early modern period, of course, we get into, uh, after the medieval, we get into early modern. Shakespeare's huge. Again, Cervantes. We've got a little bit of Chinese literature in there. We've got a little bit of Japanese literature in there um, and so on. So it, it goes through the ages until we get up to the 20th century. And then the older students, sort of the 15 year olds, we've got a thematic. We have two thematic years, actually, depending on the age and how long students stay with us. And for that, we look at um, we look at literature and history through particular lenses. So they they sort of vaguely correspond a little bit to the international uh baccalaureate diploma sort of courses. So we're we're looking at thematic cultural, um, important cultural sort of approaches to literature. And in that anything goes really. So with with my top set, we have read a little bit of nonfiction with um cast. We have read a wonderful dystopian novel this year by Bernard Beckett called Genesis. And we have read Evelyn Waugh's um, The Loved One which is a little bit of 20th century satire. So again, it it just depends on what the theme is. It's all over the place. The authors are all over the place. 
Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Aloka, would you like to introduce uh, some STEM people or would you like to run, like introduce them? Maybe exactly. Into, yes, into a word? Yes, before. I do want to have a little intro uh, to get oh. a little. I'm so sorry. Oh. Just one sec. I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm a terrible journalist. I should never be asking people questions on camera. But still, if you have any questions uh, to Bruna or on how our humanities work, please send them directly to chat or to we will be here until the end of the live stream. And uh, Bruna will gladly, I'm sure, uh, answer the questions uh, when she receives them. So you don't have to wait till the end. And the fact that we're passing from Bruna to the next person doesn't mean that it's over and you don't get a chance to ask her a question or something like that. Yes, so please, Aloka. Yeah, so, uh, okay, so this is the humanities part. Uh, we're going over to the STEM part. Uh, one thing I have to mention before actually going to the STEM part is that even though within each uh, department, everything is like very much tied, uh, very much connected. There are also, we try to establish as many connections between the departments uh, as we can. And I think I will introduce Nika right now, and then we'll tell maybe a couple examples of uh, what we did uh, within in terms of connecting the STEM department to the humanities and uh, languages and other things. So Nika here is the head of the STEM department. So Nika, can you give a little intro into how we connect everything within STEM? Oh wow, Nika, you're very you did your homework. <laughs> oh my god. Oh god. Sorry, I always do my homework. Uh yeah. Uh hello everyone. I would like to tell you briefly about the STEM department in Lesley uh and the whole STEM approach. Uh basically when we are talking about STEM, we are talking about science, technology, engineering, and, and maths. And usually inside of the STEM, we think about subjects like biology, chemistry, physics, maths, but these are not separated subjects. These are areas of knowledge, areas of science included in one big STEM subject. And students studying STEM subjects uh, are talking about various topics from biology, from chemistry, from math, without splitting them into this subject and this subject, into different types of knowledge. So they should understand that uh, topics like for example, microorganisms are not just topics from the biology course. We can talk about microorganisms and in the same way we can discuss, um, for example, how quickly they move, which type of movement do they use, what is the reactive movement from physics. We can uh, use math tools uh, in the same topic and we can connect the knowledge uh, of microorganism structures uh, with the knowledge about antibiotics and the way they act and the way they are produced um, and we can also talk about antibiotics in terms of chemistry so uh you already mentioned that we are not uh, grading our students. We're not splitting them into year five, year six, year seven. Basically, we have our curricular and we can place our student of 11 year old, uh, for example, into year one or year five based on his knowledge, based on which topics suit the student uh, better what are the needs of the student? So uh, we try to put students not in their age group, but in their level group, in the group which will fit them, which will be the best for them. And when we go from year one to year two, to year three, to year four, to year five, there is the development of the curriculum. Uh, and also there is always this reviewing part, uh, like we come back to some topics. For example, we discuss microorganisms in year three, we talk about Pasteur and vaccination, we talk about mapping the diseases, but we also talk about how microorganisms are organized, how viruses are built, what is DNA, what is RNA during year five. So we just go on a deeper level 
and we relate this. So it's not only uh, this map in your screen, it's more about life sciences, like some biological topics and chemical topics, but we also do the same when we talk about maths, physics, blocks, um, and of course, like to mention some facts about our STEM approach, we are we realize that uh, experimental part is super important. Practical work is very important for our students to see these connections between maths, physics, chemistry, biology. So we try to use experiments a lot. And if we're talking about on-site sessions, these are like real experiments, real labs and projects. And during the online sessions, we use different simulations, uh, virtual laboratories, and uh, we try to use online resources, uh, even videos to show how like, how this works and to be able to do practical stuff online, which may seem challenging for studying science online. Mm, I think that's it. If you have any questions about STEM approach, you're welcome. Ask whatever you want. Nika, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Goodness gracious, you prepared so well. <laughs> uh, okay, so- You're welcome. Uh, I have, uh, so, some of the things that I gave uh, spoilers about is it's important for us to not only connect things within the humanities or within STEM, but we do realize that in the actual, in the real world, a lot of connections between both of those, you know, areas of knowledge, even those, even you say like, this is history and this is physics, where can they possibly connect? Or this is history and this is biology. And here come the topic, say, of a London plague, uh, that students, of course, are covering in, in their history course, but then we realize there is the huge biological, like epidemiological uh, aspect in this whole topic. Uh, there is some huge general topic of epidemics uh, that has a lot of math involved in that, has a lot of statistics involved. And this is a part that we realize that we can't just cover this topic only from the historic point of view that will not be fully accurate. And at the same time, we can't only cover it through the biological point of view because we do realize there is a huge social aspect in that. And this is uh, our favorite uh, part when we do the co-teachings on that, when student, when teachers collaborate on those topics and uh, just create <clears throat> create a course together teaching those. Uh, we had a, a short one, uh, actually last session in the winter when Bruna, uh, the literature, person here has been covering um uh, what is it the frankenstein with the yeah. students uh and they've been watching him uh the production uh the theater production they've been reading a book uh we do realize that there is a huge biological biological anatomical uh bioethical uh aspect uh in frankenstein so they did a co-teaching with the science with a biology teacher biology and chemistry teacher uh on that uh i think that it was a blast uh -huh. like all the kids were they're still talking about it sometimes it was, it was great a indeed yeah yeah okay i have um a question on i have another question i have a lot of questions today uh so um what can you say? We have students from so many different countries. And my question here, I guess, would be how do we approach students having a uh, different um, mother tongue, different native language they speak, uh, not in terms of how do we accept and have help adapting to students who's, for whom English is not a native language, but more of what do we do if we have students who are native, say, French or Spanish speakers, and we kind of teach French and Spanish in school, what do they do? They, they just get an automatically highest degree and then do nothing and have a free time slot? Or do we have some actually more interesting approach? I'm spoiling in my questions yeah. again, but still. Yeah. So let me, we're uh, moving on to the foreign languages part. So, or lang general languages part. So, uh, one thing, the short answer, uh, we do teach uh, several foreign languages at school. Uh, we do have uh, Spanish, uh, French, and actually Russian as an option. And 
if a student is a native speaker in that language, it doesn't mean that they automatically get a pass. So what we, uh, how our foreign language teaching looks like, uh, the, uh, the student can, uh, we pick, can pick two out of three languages. So uh, sometimes there are cases when they're studying all the three, uh, if it fits to their schedule, um, they have to negotiate with us. So we allow them to study the third one as well. Uh, though uh, student can, t uh, can be studying language on as a foreign language uh, based on their level as well. We also place them based on their level or they can study that same language as a native. So on a native level, that would mean for each language you have group of natives uh, of Spanish speakers, of French speakers and Russian speakers, native speakers, or the speaker, uh, if people are advanced, their language is advanced enough, even if they're not native, they can also get to uh, be in that group. And this is a part where they actually study uh, that language and they have a curriculum uh, pretty much like if they were studying that in their national, somewhere where, where they teach this language nationally. So they study some grammar, they study literature in that language, they study cultural aspects, they study historical aspects. And this is uh, what we really enjoy about that. And the great thing is all the other students studying the same language language as a foreign one, uh, they get a chance to experience and uh, get an exposure to the actual native speakers already within the school. Uh, it's pretty easy to get, you know, French exposure while being on campus in French, in France. Uh, but for the Spanish, it's also great that we have actual Spanish native speakers uh, among the uh, students community within the school. So they can practice that well on the spot. Yeah. Other than that. We have French and, Lang and uh, Spanish teachers uh, present with us today. So maybe. I don't, think, I don't think Victoria is still here. I think she something happened to her. Which is upsetting, but yeah. still. May you have any questions um, on our foreign language teaching or Spanish slash French literature teaching uh, at school? Please also feel free to ask come to ask to make comments to participate, and we'll gladly pass the info, pass the question, and answer it okay. as soon as we get it. Okay, Alok, I have a last. Um, a last formal question to you, and then I have a couple uh, questions that you are probably not foreseeing me to ask. Okay. Uh, so uh, how do we, as you said, if you have, if you, if you are a native speaker, uh, you don't automatically get a passing grade. And to me, it makes much sense because we are a school to teach, not a school to get a passing grade. But talking about that, what about passing grades and grades in general? How do we approach it? What's our philosophy and mythology there? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, and generally, it's the question that's been, well, a burning uh, question and topic of discussions among all the, you know, people who work in education. Uh, why do we worry about grades that much? Uh, is there a point where we start worrying about grades more than we actually care about how we learn or how do we love to learn? How interested are we? Uh, so there are, you know, schools who decide we'll just, you know, skip all the grades. We will not grade our students at all. We'll just do that without it. There are schools that are very much, you know, achievement grade focused. We are, uh, I would say, falling between because we do still uh, grade students. Uh, the students leave the school with the whole transcript, with their grades that they can apply to high schools with that. Uh, they can send it to various programs. Though within the school, we say that we uh, care most, not about the, uh, well, if you get a grade, a, a grade, a passing grade or something like that, uh, but we care about the student actually mastering that subject. So the way we do that for each subject, uh, for each group, for each student, they will have a list of masteries uh, for each subject they're learning. Uh, same, also known as the list of goals 
for the trimester. The, this is something I need to learn by the end of this trimester. This is something I need to master. Of course, at the end of the trimester, we'll grade it with actual you know, numbers. But within the trimester, the teachers just give feedback. Okay, let's look at this. Looks like this is the topic that you uh, are not you know, um, getting well enough yet. Let's work more on that. Or I think this is the topic that you already know very much. I think we're good with that. So we have all those conversations with the students uh, through each trimester, through the course of each trimester a lot. Like these are your goals for this trimester. Where are you with, uh, within that list? Uh, where are you with, this, you with your math goals? Where are you with your literature goals, uh, with your masteries? And this is how we generally approach the grading, uh, the grading or you know, assessing the student's knowledge. So it's, uh, it has several benefits for, uh, I mean, formal benefit, of course, as well, because we know exactly what students know by the end of the, uh, their graduation, their transcript is actually uh, super understandable. So if we transfer it to another high school, they can really see what the student knows. Uh, they can really uh, identify what their level is, what are the topics that they have covered and they have mastered based on that transcript. Uh, on the other hand, uh, that also gives us a chance, gives students a chance uh, to feel to have ownership of their learning, to have their own responsibility of their learning. So it's not uh, like they just show up at the class and see what awaits them uh, there, but they know ahead of time that this is something that they'll be working on. And it's we also remind them all the time that it's their responsibility to go through all this ma those masteries is their responsibility. So we'll ask them at some point, where are you here? If this one is not working, let's think together, what can we do about it? Uh, do you need some extra, do you need to go to the office hour and ask for some more you know, materials or explanations? Do you need extra time to work on it? Do you need extra help from, uh, from a teacher or somebody else? So uh, this is a chance, and this is very also a huge value for us that the students, uh, take ownership and take responsibility for their learning. And going ahead, uh, many of our graduates say that this is something, this is a skill that helped them a lot in their uh, high schools and later in college that they actually, that it all makes sense to them. And they actually realize that, well, it's their, their learning and they're the people who are, it's not that they're randomly placed <laughs> and need to, you know, wait, uh, sit through the school and wait until it's over, but it's something, uh, you know, it's, it's an active process for them. Exactly. Thank you so much. Uh, my next question would be, and that's almost the last one. As you know, we have been promoting the open house and social media. And before the actual event, our social media team passed us, uh, passed me a bunch of questions that we received through Facebook, Instagram, and other platforms. Uh, the same way it works for you uh, and me previously. So a question to the academic lead that was asked on Instagram uh, is, Aloka, who is your favorite teacher? Who is my favorite teacher in the school? Yes. Uh, you know what? I'm not allowed to answer the question. Um, I can, can I cheat on the, <laughs> okay. So I People would say ask. the favorite teacher in the school uh -huh. is, uh, it's a fluid concept. Is the teacher, I think we do have the amazing team of teachers. And I do say not only because this is the school I work at and this is something I have, but I really believe that this is an incredible group of people uh, dedicated, uh, you know, very much inspired and something like the work that they do with students and the dedication and the, how much they put into it, much time and energy they put in. It's just, I mean, incredible. And how much creativity they put into it as well. Um, so meaning that my favorite teacher at uh, every particular moment can be a different one. Uh, and usually it's the teacher I'm currently working with on some project, uh, on some project that we're working on right now on either co-teaching or some, I don't know, performance project or something like that. So usually it's that very teacher. And at that point, I have to confess, usually this is my favorite teacher at the, at the moment. Though it happens to different people, different people, you know, 
Okay, thank you. And the other question I have, and that's going to be the final question, is a question that reverses the question whenever you interview people for uh, who who want to get a scholarship or generally like join school, you ask them, uh, you have a favorite question and I have a favorite question of mine. And this question to you reverses your favorite question, which will be Aloka. What makes it a good class for you? Oh yeah. I love that question. I, we do ask the question to students who we interview for the school. We? I do ask that question. Okay. Uh, what makes it a good class? So Beyond. <laughs> I have a lot of experience, uh, you know, as students as well in our schools, uh, getting all kind of random classes. And uh, some classes were good for sure, but we all had classes that were, well, that was not that was not a good class. That was either a boring class or a class I really didn't like or something like that. Uh, so we are asking each kid, I'm asking each kid, uh, what is their, say, recipe? What would be their recommendation? Uh, what would make it a really great class? Actually, the, the answers are really different. So for me, uh, and this is just my personal preference, uh, some people, the classes are different, the teacher's personalities are different, the teacher's styles are different. Uh, but my personal preference is the class when students are the ones working uh, and the most and talking the most and uh, let's say even leading the most. If I personally, or like another teacher working, uh, manages to achieve that and uh, stay as a, take, you know, a supportive role there, a mentoring role, not, the, you know, the front, the front man role, this is something, uh, when this happens, this is my favorite. Thank you so much. And at this point, uh, unless we have some more questions on the academics, I think we are done with the topic of today's open house. However, we have one more question that you can answer, or I'm, I'll am i be happy to answer as well, um, because it's not related to the academics part, but it was asked in the registration form by one of the people who is actually in Zoom right now. So they joined us today to probably get an answer on this question. So the question is, is there financial aid available and what are the conditions to qualify? Um, I think I can, I can tell about that if you don't mind. So we generally believe that we want to be a school accessible to everybody who needs us, to as many students as possible. And what we do is uh, we highly encourage everybody to apply. And if you if you feel that the full tuition is too high for you and not something you would be willing to pay or able to pay, we encourage you to fill in the financial aids form. It is based on, so we have financial aids, which is, um, determined by our sponsors and donators and charity foundations that help us um, in part and um, the amount of of the aid you of the help you'll actually get uh, is related to your family income to your life situation and other uh, this kind of parameters and then we also have scholarships uh, which uh, can be, which are often merit-based scholarship. For example, this year we have a math full scholarship. So if you think that your kid is strong in math or very interested in math, you can apply to this scholarship. Our math teachers will uh, interview the student and they will pick the strongest and or you know, the, the best fitting one. Uh, and this person will get a scholarship regardless of their family situation, income, and other circumstances. Uh, and then there are also kind of partial scholarships that you can get. So if you get second place, you can get a partial math scholarship um, and other stuff like that. So generally, if you're interested, um, short answer, we do offer a lot of scholarships and a lot of financial aids. So 
please apply, uh, fill in the info. When you apply, you will have the questions that we ask and those are all the requirements. Answer honestly and yeah. Okay. Um, we just received a comment from one of the people uh, listening to us today. Um, fantastic Open House and Academics uh, just now. Just wanted to tell you that strongly agree with your teaching philosophy. Thank you so much. We thank you, Mark. That matters a lot and that warms our little hearts. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much um, for coming today. If you have any further questions after watching this or or have them right now, please send uh, all of them, send them to us and we will be happy to answer tomorrow on the final day of our open house or in comments or reaching out to you personally or answering publicly if that's a commonly asked question. Um, yes, thank you so much and see you all tomorrow, right? Thank you. Bye. Dear colleagues, thank you for coming and joining. We thank appreciate you. this specifically. We hope you're as happy as our uh, visitors. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.